My name is Dr. Amanda Chisholm, and I'm a senior lecturer in the School of Security Studies here at King's College London. Today, we are speaking with one of the leading experts on men and masculinities in the context of conflict and peace building, Dr. Henry Martinin. Dr. Martinin is currently a co-investigator in the Masculinities and Sexualities Research Stream of the Gender, Justice and Security Hub at the London School of Economics, Women, Peace and Security Centre. He has worked extensively on gender, conflict, and peace building uh, for a number of NGOs. He joins us from Yangon to discuss his research. Welcome, Henry. Hi. Great, great to speak to you. And great. thanks for having me. Oh, lovely that you um, can make the time to speak with us today. Henry, we've got a series of questions for you. So uh, mm -hmm. hope you're ready for them. Um, the first one is I just, uh, you've said, you know, in, in your writing, um, that whilst engaging with men and boys in fragile and conflict affected uh, situations is not new, the vast majority of these interventions don't consider the role of masculinities play in influencing and directing male behavior. What do you mean by masculinities in this context? Um, yeah, so uh, I mean, masculinity is kind of a, you know, the most basic way of looking at it is just the the ways in which men and boys are uh, expected to act as men, um, but it, it can also be um, be people who are sort of not biologically men who act in particular ways which are associated with manhood. Let's say, for example, um, women in the military might be expected to perform in masculine ways to fit into that organization. And kind of what I, what I mean with that. Um, that, that uh, quote that you uh, mentioned there is that when we look at conflict and war, um, we talk about uh, political leaders, we look, talk about soldiers, about peacekeepers, uh, which for the most part are men um, in all of the armed forces of the world, in all of the guerrilla movements, uh, in terrorist groups, uh, and so on. Most of the people carrying weapons are men, but we seldom or relatively seldomly think about how the way in which they have been taught to be men and the way in which they expect to be men and the way in which others expect them to be men affect their behavior. And we don't look at uh, the ways, for example, in which peace negotiators, who again are mostly men, uh, see the world in a certain way because they've been raised to be certain kinds of men. Um, and I think that's something where, where there's a lot more to be done to unpack some of these ways in which um, masculinities, uh, the expectations on men shape our world. Uh, and I think there's been a lot of work, a lot of really interesting work done on women's perspectives and the impacts of conflict on women and the role of femininities. Uh, but uh, the, the corresponding look at men and masculinities, that's still lagging quite a bit behind in terms of research. Yeah. Um, you know, we hear the term toxic masculinity um, being talked about a lot and often described, you know, as misogynistic, abusive, um, sexist behavior, although there's no universal accepted definition to what, what this, you know, term looks like or feels like. Uh, do you think using the label does more harm than good? And if so, how do you think we should refer to masculine behaviors that harm gender equality and, and, and cause social discord or even violence in different contexts and cultures? Yeah, and I think sort of the term uh, toxic masculinity in many ways is um, a really good term, an easy term to use, uh, which is also why it's not a good term to use. Um, so what I mean with that is that uh, when we say toxic masculinity, everyone can immediately imagine something uh, and it's like, aha, okay, I know what we're talking about. Um, but that's kind of the, the problem as well. Uh, so it's, it's a good shorthand, but then by being a good shorthand, it also um, encompasses a lot of different uh, types types of masculinities and also uh, papers over a lot of important differences between these masculinities. And I think it's, it's, it's that there is a need to go a bit deeper than just the label. Uh, so it's a good entry point, uh, but we do need to dig deeper. So if we, for example, to use a, um, a, a somebody who's been associated with toxic masculinity quite a bit, um, Donald Trump, for example, is often spoken of in terms of having toxic masculinity. But he also uses 
notions of toxic, toxic masculinity when talking about others. So when he's talking about uh, the bad hombres coming from uh, Central America to the US, he's also referring to particular men and their masculinities and, and negative issues associated with that. Um, and that's, that's kind of where the, the difficulty then comes in. So if we're using the term toxic masculinity to cover the masculinity of a Donald Trump, who is a billionaire, white American billionaire in his uh, 70s, and say that his way of being a man is the same as that of a 15, 16 year old uh, lower class, working class man from uh, Honduras or El Salvador who's joined the Maras. Um, I think we're, we're pushing too much into one category and, and we do need to see, um, see, see what is, or unpack those individual masculinities a lot more and see what the historical uh, and the econ economic contexts are in which those have been produced. Um, but there, there are of course then also overlaps between the two. So for example, a Donald Trump and a member of the Maras, both of them might have this, um, the, 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 this um, buy-in into ways of being a man, which is misogynistic, which is uh, sort of quite macho and, and puts a lot of um, value on being seen to be powerful and not taking any slights. I think, I think there are sort of some uses to the term because it opens up discussions, but it's important to then go further into those discussions and, and be a bit more nuanced and understand what it is that we're talking about in a particular context. Yeah, so like you said, context, um, histories, all of that becomes important. So um, um, ensuring that we don't universalize any of our concepts we use, right? That we always um, situate them within the broader histories and economies and contexts of which, you know, they're situated and become meaningful. Good. So, uh, you know, I think anyone who studies men and masculinities and who's a feminist comes up with this kind of tension that, you know, there's a risk that focusing on men and their needs and aspirations that we can deprioritize the unmet needs of women and girls in the quest for gender equality or that we further entrench patriarchy or centering of men um, by, by making it more palatable. How do you, as a scholar of men and masculinities, mitigate, mitigate against this? Yeah, and I think that that is, is very much real risk. Um, it's, I, a lot of my work is in, in the policy sector and in, in, uh, in and with NGOs. And, and what you can see often is that there's a bit of a sense of like, oh, uh, women and girls and, and women's rights issues a bit passe, let's look at the new and shiny thing, which is engaging with men. And that there is really a re real risk there of um, kind of thinking that we've, we've fulfilled all the needs that women might have now can talk about the men and that's that's definitely not the case um and men do have a tendency um unfortunately of, of kind of sucking up the oxygen quite easily in, in the rooms and in discussions so i think that is very much a, a valid um critique and, and, and a valid sort of um, thing to be aware of when working on men and masculinity is a really important thing to be aware of um in, in working on sort of the NGO side and policy side, what we do try to um, do in, in the work which, which me and my colleagues do is, is to ensure that uh, we are constantly sort of in touch with women's rights organizations as well, and also make sure that we acknowledge the, the hard work that they've done in bringing us, us to this point where, where we can have these critical discussions about gender, or about issues like sexual violence against men and boys. We wouldn't be able to talk about that if women hadn't done all of the hard work of opening up discussions on sexual violence against women and girls. Uh, so I think kind of like uh, having having that those critical allies and, and being ready to take on that criticism from women's rights organizations or from feminist scholars, I think is, is really important. Um, I mean, so some of my work um, is focused on issues around men and men's identity and how that links with violence. And there it can often be somewhat difficult to bring in, at least sort of in the local context, uh, women's perspectives on, on issues, because these um, issues might be sort of seen as things, as, as men's issues, and, 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 and women feel that they're not able to talk about these issues and are reluctant to talk about these issues. Um, and I think that that is also something that needs to be respected. We don't, we shouldn't be pushing anyone to um, 
answer questions or take stances on issues that they're uncomfortable with. But there, there is then also a need to, like, even if that happens, to make sure that I, as the researcher, then do engage with women in that space and talk to women's rights organizations, for example, about their views on these issues and not just say, oh, well, the women didn't want to talk about it, so I didn't need to talk to them. Mm. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, it's a gender is always relational, right? So um, bring it, bringing in a multitude of um, stakeholders and people's perspectives is key. Absolutely. I think, you know, with the, like you mentioned with the, you know, the, the history of women's activism um, has been at the fore or underpins really the women, peace and security agenda, right? Um, and, and the broader recognition uh, of um, women's experiences and, and of violence against women in conflict is not natural or inevitable and unfortunate, right? But um, it's, you know, a war crime and, and we need to think about this and think about uh, women, um, uh, their specific needs in war. I guess I'm wondering, you know, this leads me to think about so we know, and I guess it's well accepted that we need to pay attention to women in war and, and, and women's experiences in war. But for you, what does paying attention to not just men, but masculinities in particular, when we're seeking to understand war and violence, what, what does that bring to the table? How does that help? Um, or does that help our, the, the broader women, peace and security agenda? So it's a really kind of a lead on from your, from your previous statement. I just wonder conceptually if you, can, if you can walk us through, what does this bring to the table? Sure. Um, I think uh, kind of one of the starting points is coming back to sort of the, the very first question around um, men and masculinity and conflict um, is that uh, in spaces of conflict, the vast majority of those who are carrying arms uh, are in uniform, be it on one side or the other, or be, be peacekeepers, uh, and the, thereby also the majority of perpetrators of violence are men. And there's an expectation on men to be uh, the, the protectors of community or join armed forces, join a guerrilla force. And there's there's a lot of um, I mean, men are brought up in, in, in societies across the planet to to live up to those warrior protector expectations. And that's something that's buttressed through uh, through movies, through books, the kind of toys boys play play with, and so on. Um, so 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 there there is that link ready made between men and armed violence um, and sort of unpacking that link is something that that is essential to working towards ending that violence but also to to looking at some of the, the impacts that that has on on society more broadly um, so for example if you look at issues like domestic violence which again is mostly perpetrated by by men um, there is a direct link in, in research that's been done in post-conflict societies in, in the Balkans, for example, or in Ukraine, uh, that men who have been in combat or uh, experienced war either as civilians or as combatants then also have a higher propensity for um, perpetrating violence in the long run, even decades after the, the end, end of the war, in part because of this link between masculinity and violence, but also because as men, we're often taught to not engage with our emotions, not engage with our trauma. Um, and, and there isn't, isn't that space to work through emotions in any kind of other way than through anger and violence and, and often sort of catalyzed by substance abuse, which again is, is quite masculine coded. Um, so, so I think that there's these various kinds of ways in which masculinities flow together with violence and, and, and perpetration of violence, but also um, victimization by violence. If you look at uh, the victims of armed violence in conflict, but also in situations like in say Central America, uh, the vast majority of men, because there is that expectation of men to be in those spaces or, or be, being seen as potential combatants. Um, so I think men, men are quite central uh, for better or for worse, or mostly for worse, uh, to issues of violence. And that is in intimately and intricately linked with notions of masculinity. Yeah, I think, you know, your, why um, your work is, is so amazing and brings such um, a rich and important contribution to a broader understanding of gender and war is that it is rooted in empirics, it's rooted in sustained field work, it's rooted working directly with NGOs, 
and local communities of um, you know the the real challenges are around conflict and in post conflict settings of uh, addressing not only structures, gender structures of power, but performances and ways of being and being a man and, and, and feeling valued as a man and whatnot. And I just wonder throughout, you know, all of this field engagement that you, you have and the, the research that you've done, what approaches and interventions have you seen work when it comes to transforming concepts of masculinity in societies that in the hopes of reducing the damage they can inflict um, uh, the, the violence that these sorts of masculinities and ways of being a men um, have. Um, so I guess, yeah, thinking about it, you know, the transformation of uh, manhood and masculinities to move away from, like you said, the, the immediate link to violence and abuse um, in conflict to, to being something other. What, what sort of approaches or interventions have worked or have they? Yeah, uh, I mean, there's, there's been a lot of really uh, interesting and, and really groundbreaking work that's been done uh, by mostly by quite small local NGOs in, in different parts of the world. Um, I mean, some of the partners that I've been working with in, in, in Lebanon, for example, or in uh, the former Yugoslav countries, um, or in, in uh, Eastern Congo, um, or, or in Colombia, they, they, they I think one of the keys to their success is, is being very much rooted in the local context. So there, there isn't one uh, cookie cutter approach that you can take from country X to country Y and it's going to work. Um, and, and a lot of it is really also built on long-term sustained engagement by very, very dedicated people who, who then put in um, hours and hours beyond their regular working hours into working with uh, with men of different ages to to try and as you say sort of break that link between uh, masculinities and violence and these cycles of violence um and uh, so, so there isn't really one um uh, one single approach that that will work but um i think some of the commonalities are um having that localized approach and speaking kind of the local um local cultural language so to say for example sort of in uh, in Eastern Congo, um, when I was sitting in on, on the work done by some of these groups, a lot of the um, the ways in which uh, different ways of being a man and positive masculinity was being explained was by using um, Bible references. So the, these are communities which are, are deeply Christian. Um, and then looking at some of the work done, for example, in, in Lebanon, uh, in, in some cases, there is a more faith-based approach, sometimes it's more of a secular approach. Um, so, so really sort of drawing on what, it, what is a, a local cultural um, way of speaking about these issues. And, and that, that's obviously gonna be different. Um, I think something else that is, is really key is um, making sure that you don't try and skirt away from painful issues or, or difficult issues. So, so one of the groups um, I was also looking at in, in Serbia, um, but they also do uh, so there's similar work going on in, in Bosnia and in Kosovo, Albania, um, really sort of at, at the outset really goes into tackling homophobia and misogyny and, and, and really sort of takes that head on and doesn't try to sort of airbrush these, these negative uh, aspects of of masculinity, so ways of being, and expectations of being a man, a way to so really tackling that um, head on. And I think it's also really important to take uh, opposition to change uh, and, and resistance to change seriously. Um, so a lot of men are uh, in, in many different ways invested into these ways of being a man, which do have negative impacts and, and, and will resist that change and, and don't necessarily want to change. And, and change is made difficult by the environments that they're in where they are a, a softer kind of man, so to say. They will be ridiculed by their peers, they will be shunned by family members and so on. Um, so I think it's, it's really important to engage with that resistance, engage with that opposition uh, and, and not uh, run away from it. So I think that those would be some of the, the key elements. Um, and I think also ensuring that there is, if possible, uh, then also a, a linking of this norms change with, um, with the possibility of reducing some of the other uh, stress factors in, in men's lives. Um, 
like economic stress factors. So, so uh, in some of the work we did previously um, in Tajikistan, we combined gender norm change with uh, increasing livelihoods opportunities um, and involving men and women. Um, and I think that that kind of that there is often an immense expectation on men. Uh, from others, but also from themselves, to be the breadwinners, to be the the ones who sustain themselves and sustain their families, um, and the the often impossibility or huge difficulties of meeting that those expectations are a key factor in frustrations as well, um, and frustrations that then can lead to violence because, as as mentioned, men are often conditioned to not talk about those frustrations openly. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, what I'm getting from that is it's ridiculously complicated. It requires, you know, sustained local perspectives. There's no one size fits all, of course. Um, it involves the a community. So not just the men, um, but women as well. And it's not just a matter of, of discourse or how we think and, and feel about things, but the, there's a material implication for this too, yes, right? Absolutely. All around this. Um, yeah, um, I, I guess, you know, you did touch on homophobia and you did touch on a, a little bit of the, the, the LGBTQI plus community. I'm just wondering if you could maybe expand a bit more on that and what does bringing that community, you know, into the fore of our analysis, but how we also practice policy and practice kind of um, um, broader peace um, in these spaces, um, you know, so a queer, but also the LGBTQI plus community, what does that do for our analysis, but also how we practice um, peace in, in post-conflict settings? Sure, um, I mean, I'll, I'll try to keep my, my answer short because it's, it's, it is quite a broad topic. Um, I mean, kind of two, maybe two, two ways in which I, I would approach that is one is, um, if we're talking about gender and, and conflict and, and trying to look at who is who is the most vulnerable in conflicts or, or, or what does bring gender perspectives in, into peace and in conflict work, um, then, then looking at some of these um, diverse so to, uh, LGBTI perspectives um, can really help us see some in, in a really sort of, sort of uh, heightened fashion how gender plays a role in underpinning uh, violent ideologies, but also violence at the micro level. So basically what I mean with that is like, if you look at um, homophobic and transphobic violence in the context of conflicts and who uses that and who mobilizes around homophobia and, and misogyny for that matter, because these often go hand in hand, um, we see a hugely wide range of groups, um, secular groups from the hard left to the hard right. Uh, we see uh, religious groups from all major world religions mobilizing around homophobia, around misogyny, around um, this being a threat to their culture, be it in um, in the South Caucasus, be it in, in Southeast Asia, be it in, in Islamic societies, be it in, in sort of more Christian societies. So, so we have a lot of mobilization around this issue. And I think that that really sort of raises the question, what, what's, what's happening here? What, what is it about these gender identities that are pushing beyond the, the traditional limit of what it means to be a man or a woman? <clears throat> and a traditional sort of, again, has of course, has to be sort of questioned as to how traditional that is. But uh, the, these notions of what a man should be and what a woman should be, and, and you have individuals and communities transgressing that, that leads to this massive violence and, and, and massive counter reaction to that. So, so I think that is a, it's a really interesting opening there to think about what is it about that transgression that makes, that provokes these violences? Why is it that this is seen as something that needs to be countered with sometimes extreme violence. And I think that's, that's something that we can look at at the macro level, at the ideological level. Like why is it that the, um, let's just say some, someone like the Maoist uh, shining path in Peru mobilizes around the same issue as um, far right neo-Nazi groups in Hungary in a very different context as does Islamic State in, uh, in Syria, as does the, the, so the uh, born-again Christian groups in, in Uganda. So what's, what's happening here? 
around these peers, around gender and transgressions of gender roles and, and the readiness to use violence. I think that that does open up perspective to look into that deeper. But it's also something that I think um, allows us to think about uh, what's happening at the personal level, at, at the micro level. Um, why is it that on a, a pre-COVID lockdown Sunday, uh, Saturday night in a pub in Newcastle, um, some a group of men feel so threatened in their masculinities by another man who's who might have an earring or might have longer hair that they beat him to a pulp for for being quote unquote gay so there's something happening there that around these transgressions around these feelings of unsettling of gender norms that provokes violence but both at the ideological level and at the individual micro level that's that's really interesting um, to, to to look deeper into but yeah. then there is beyond that kind of more academic side there is also then the ethical side of if we really do want to look at some of the most vulnerable groups in society and how they're impacted by conflict how they're impacted by violence then uh, people like uh, tran the transgender population are among some of the most vulnerable in in all societies great i mean so you're really saying you know what i get from that is is two key points is one that is it um when you bring a queer look in and you bring in um, LGBTQI populations, when you, you raise the question that or highlight the point that people are not born vulnerable, they're made vulnerable, right? And so what does this tell us about the broader exactly. systems of power, structures of power, uh, ways of being that makes these people vulnerable, right? So that gives us knowledge into power and the operations of power through gender and sexuality logics. And then importantly, you also highlight a very um, vulnerable yet often ignored community, right? Within the broader WPS agenda. I mean, they're, they're emerging now, we're starting to recognize, but very vulnerable in peace and conflict times, right? This is the, you know, the, the stats on, uh, on life expectancy of trans communities globally is significantly lower than, um, you know, other communities, for example, too. So, so it raises, um, a, a renders visible a very important group of people um, and then also tells us something really interesting about power gender power and, and and sexuality and how that's operating on global and local scales so and if i could if i could maybe jump in there, there quickly, yeah. something that i forgot to mention um i think so what, what i've really found um in looking at um the impacts of conflict and displacement on uh, lgbti individuals and communities is is just how pertinent some of the, the older feminist critiques of how we consider conflict and violence are. So these concepts of how there isn't really, for many people, a clear dividing line between armed conflict and peace, the way we think about it. that in times of peace, uh, a lot of women, but also uh, a majority of the LGBTI population is under constant threat of violence and insecurity. Um, and, and that the kind of the maxim of the personal is political is extremely pertinent in the context of LGBTI uh, persons and communities in peacetime and in wartime. And, and you have this continuum of violence that they face, um, which, which many women face as well, and, uh, and other marginalized parts of societies, um, ethnically marginalized communities, for example, and persons of color. Excellent, important point to make. Absolutely, the yeah, the idea of and that challenges more of the, you know, um, liberal or realist kind of notions of what peace is, right? Um, and and the dichotomy between war and peace for definitely a critical feminist um, perspective, queer perspective, and even postcolonial perspective would I argue exactly what you're saying. There's a continuum, right? There's, um, and and we need to contextualize how we understand peace right and 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 conflict um you know what i love about a, a recent paper um you wrote is that you discuss the concept of new forms of masculinity and whether these um, actually, you know, stabilize rather than challenge patriarchy, right? And I think, you know, you include the label of gender champion and um, gender men 
uh, attributing to some of the high profile leaders such as um, Justin Trudeau who have promoted gender equality and feminism or his version of feminism, um, but, um, but do so from very much a, a place of power and privilege. And I'm wondering if you can share some of your thinking on this and also at the same time, your so own self-reflections. Of course, we've had multiple conversations about this previously, Henry, but your own reflections of being a privileged white man working in gender um, equality spaces. So if you can just offer some of your reflections on that. Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, far be it from me to compare myself to Justin Trudeau, <laughs> but, I, but I think there, there are some, um, definitely some, 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 some clear, um, similarities and the privileges that, that both of us uh, share as, as white privileged middle-aged men. Um, and I think what, what, what really stri struck me is that um, so there's a lot of these things that um, I've been, for example, in, in, my, in my work, in my, um, in, in my research, been highlighting, um, I mean, a lot of it builds on generations of work that's come before for me, uh, that's been done by feminist activists, by feminist researchers, and it doesn't necessarily, or for the most part, doesn't really say anything new. Um, these are, are, are critiques that uh, women have been raising for a long time, um, but there is the difference that now is someone like me, a, a privileged white man, a little class white man who's, who's saying these things, and, and that gives me um, entrance to places and, 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 and gives us some kind of currency and, and, and capital that a lot of women who have been saying the same thing uh, never had. They, they didn't get the same kind of attention that I get because of who I am and, and uh, what I'm um, kind of embodying with, through my presence. Uh, I think that that is problematic uh, in the, the, the kinds of critiques that, that I put forward uh, are taken more seriously because I'm saying them compared to, for example, a uh, one of my my um, African female colleagues who would then be just labeled as angry black women. Whereas when I s say it, it seems, oh, okay, this is rational because it's a white man saying it. And I think that that kind of power disbalance and power imbalance is something that uh, we need to be aware of. I need to be aware of definitely and and, and um, understand how just how much um, I am building on the work of others, but also just how much I, I'm being uh, boosted by the by, by patriarchal structures um, and, and also the, the way in which these patriarchal structures are not necessarily challenged by what I'm doing or what I'm saying, but might be stabilized by bringing on or, or by, by co-opting the critique that I'm bringing to the table. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, that's such an important critique, and it's a critique, I think, myself as a white middle class educated woman also experiences a great amount of privilege in social capital and the things I say, and just having a conversation with um, Julia Wellen yesterday about that, and, you know, she made a, a really uh, important comment saying, if you think what you're saying is new, likely a woman of color has said it before. Right. So it's just, you know, it's I think, you know, it's 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 also us as academics citation practices who we bring into the conversation. Who do we, you know, attribute um, knowledge to it, it is is so key as well. I guess, you know, it's really great that, you know, yourself, you know, the, the perpetual self-reflection is part of the feminist ethic as well, too. Um, when when we think about our own relation to power and privilege. But just going back to Trudeau, like I wonder you know, um, is it bad that he's touting feminism, right? Like what, what's bad about that? I guess if you can maybe reflect upon that. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I, think, I think it's a bit of sort of a yes, but situation. Um, and and I, I would sort of uh, say that, that that applies to me as well. I think it's, it's um, I, I don't think it's a bad thing that I'm um, raising these kinds of issues or, or that Trudeau is raising these kinds of issues but we need to be held accountable by others and we need to hold ourselves accountable. Um, and I, mean, I, I, I don't know enough about Canadian politics uh, to, to give sort of a detailed critique of, of Trudeau's uh, politics. But um, I mean, one thing that does kind of strike me, for example, is that he's, he's very good at um, 
talking the talk, but does he actually then follow through on issues like um, uh, disappearances and femicides of indi indigenous women? Um, and and is, is there something that goes beyond just um, having these kind of uh, quite photogenic and, and a nice sound bites around feminism? Or is there actually an attempt to really do um, undo some of the, the, the historical and structural harms that have been committed against uh, women of color, um, indigenous First Nations populations, um, or, or is it just for show? And is it, is it just kind of a slogan, uh, a hashtag that, that he mobilizes? Um, and I, I, I fear that with him, it probably tends to be more of the latter instead of the, the actual structural change that he would be to a degree in a position to, to um, act upon. Yeah. I guess bringing it back to from again from the the state leader back to us as as privileged academics like what you know what would be kind of key advice you would give to you know younger scholars or just scholars you know our colleagues alike who are white who are are white men white cis men doing this sort of research how to be a good ally like what kind of key advice would you would you give to them so they don't you know uh, kind of reinforce these power dynamics or at least try and disrupt these power dynamics? Um, I think what one would be to listen more. Um, I mean, you, you, you mentioned some of the uh, kind of citation practice and, and, and um, broadening the, the, the range of literature that we engage with. Um, and I think that that's really important um, and, and kind of also going out of your own comfort zone a bit and, and not just citing the the, um, the, the the male stream, so to say, of literature, but, but going going beyond that. But I think a lot of it, for me at least, comes down to really trying to listen and to try to understand what it is what you're being told by your interlocutors, uh, be it in a research situation or or by colleagues, or especially sort of more junior colleagues, or or in other ways of less um, but less privileged colleagues and, or, or, or um, staff members and, and taking that seriously and, and taking critiques on, on board and not dismissing them. Um, and it, it's, it's taking, and I think it's also the learning to um, take on that criticism and, and that critique of, of privilege, which can, can be quite painful because none of us likes to be seen as, as the bad person or as the, the oppressor and, and or, or most of us don't want to be seen as that. And most of us do like to keep up a self image of us doing good. And when that comes under fire, especially when you are already trying to go out of your way to do something good, uh, can be difficult, but it's, it's something that that's coming out of a position of privilege, we really need to be open to doing and, and, and questioning ourselves. Um, and I think also then, um, especially for men, um, it's, it's also the need to step back and, and give that space to others and not always push ourselves to the front and, and always be the ones who have to be doing the talking, have to be the first author and whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, those are some great advice. And I think, yeah, in any, any sort of confrontation with your own privilege is uncomfortable, but productive and necessary, right? In order for us um, to, to move forward and to be better allies. I want to end our discussion with a final question or rather, I guess, two interrelated questions. And that is, <clears throat> excuse me, what made you first curious about masculinities in the war? And where did you think he, um, we need to go as a community of scholars in studying gender and post-conflict? So, you know, the, the first is more of a historical recount of, of you and what made you interested in this sort of research and then more of a future kind of outlooking of where do we need to go from here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I mean, <laughs> so it, it doesn't happen very often in my life, but uh, in terms of... Um, starting to get curious about masculinities and in, in conflict or post-conflict, uh, I, I can actually pin it down to a specific moment, which was um, when I was, so I, I don't come from a social sciences background. I was, I was um, did my master's in engineering and then I was working for a, uh, an organization that was working on so former military sites. And um, we, we had the sort of gender, learning group, uh, informal group, and we were re reading through some texts about sort of gender and, and displacement, and, and re remember this one piece that was about um, 
IDPs in Georgia, uh, about people who'd fled from the Abkhaz Georgian war. And um, suddenly I noticed that this was the first one and the only time that men and masculinities were being mentioned in any of the literature that we were reading. Um, and it was just a, a, a sentence about how all of the men in that IDP camp or IDP settlement uh, spent their time drinking, gambling, and uh, committing acts of violence be it against other, other men or against family members. Um, and then I was like, that sort of sparked my curiosity. It was like, what, why, why is this the only time that men have been mentioned? And um, sort of coming from a engineering background, I, I assumed that there was already going to be this whole massive body of literature on men in conflict and masculinities in conflict. Because uh, for, for me as an outsider, um, I was like, well, that's obvious because 90% of soldiers are men, 90% of people with weapons are men, obviously someone's looked at it, but um, at least at the time, and this was quite a while back, uh, there, there, there was very little, there, there, there was that invisibility of masculinities in conflict situations, so um, yeah, then I was kind of pushed, <laughs> uh, shoved a bit into, um, or dropped into the deep end by a colleague who was like, well, here's your chance to do something about it. And, and she volunteered me to write an article about um, men and, uh, and and weapons and arms. And um, yeah, I foolishly agreed and, and, and that just sent me down that, <laughs> that rabbit hole. Um, in terms of where, uh, where, where to go next, um, I think um, that there's, there's a lot that's been already said, and again, already been said by, by feminist uh, scholars of color, especially uh, around, uh, but, but I think it's been said, but hasn't really been acted upon. And there's a lot more that needs to be done around that, especially around issues of uh, intersectionality, for example. It's, 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 a, it's a massive buzzword at the moment, but there is actually relatively little um, research that really does take that intersectional lens um, as a starting point and looking at um, gender uh, masculinities and femininities or other gender identities in, in a more complex and nuanced way. Um, I think that that's really something that um, I, I, is, is starting to happen, but I, I really would, would like to see a whole lot more of that happening. Uh, and I think also the uh, something that also speaks to the changing nature of conflicts is the, the breaking down of that, this is peace, this is war dichotomy. And it's something that, as I mentioned, I mean, feminist scholars have been talking about that for decades, but now it's something that's really also entering the uh, conflict studies, war studies sphere of like what, what's happening with this kind of hybrid warfare, for example. And I think there, there's a lot there that can be where sort of feminist perspectives are already a bit ahead of the game and, and, and trying to understand how war and peace are not mutually exclusive spaces, but it's, it's, it's sort of this gray zone in between for many people. And I think that lastly, um, and this is something that, that uh, kind of came up in, in some research I was doing in Ukraine last year, was the, um, the way in which gender itself, the discourse around gender has become a, a literal battlefield. So for, for example, in, in the case of Ukraine, how um, other states, Russia, for example, are mobilizing around questions of gender and, and using that kind of as a, as a key battleground in this hybrid warfare against uh, what, what Russia sees as its rival, the, the Ukrainian government. Um, and uh, it's some, something that, that I think we need to be also very aware of how we as researchers are working on a topic that it's, itself has literally become weaponized. It's something where um, different actors and in different countries are pouring money into its intelligence agencies, uh, uh, militaries are mobilizing around discourse of gender, are mobilizing around what people think about Judith Butler, are mobilizing around what Cynthia Enel says, and, and, and trying to turn that as a way to undermine societies and, and create um, uh, wreak havoc or, or great disturbances and, and, and shake trusts in institutions. So I think that that's something where, where I think there's unfortunately probably going to be a lot more happening over the next years and decades.
yeah, so lots more work to be done in lots of very interesting and often worrying um, trends trends to be uh, researching and 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 looking through. And I guess you know even just the the Trump era, the Brexit era, all of this has reminded us of these hard fought one rights um, and and logics that we would just assume as common sense now are you know can easily be rolled back and erode it too right so all of this um, is, is still quite reminds us how fragile it is how fragile these these winds are and, and and can be and 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 alerts us to the ways in which yeah gender like you said can be weaponized and is being um, um, weaponized as as we speak in in different in different parts of the world by different world leaders. Um, Henry, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day, hectic days, um, to share your research, your insights, and your experiences with us on men and masculinities, um, violence, conflict, post-conflict kind of continuum. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks.